Esa Esa Sunlight My whole life is obsessed with thinking about how humans and animals create a world together. And so that was sort of who I was when I met David. In my and he took me on, on a cattle drive through town. It was a great, a great second date. Blindly, blindly, blindly. And so at that point, I was a vegetarian. And I remember I was driving over here, and I was like, why am I driving to go on a date with a cattle rancher? Like, this doesn't make any sense. But I did it, and I guess the rest is sort of history. So a lot of people say that cows are stupid, or I've heard people say that, but I think they're really smart. And often when we're moving, and once they sort of, it's like once they decide they're going to go, then they go. It's kind of their decision. And they figure it out. <laughs> That's a trouble. <laughs> oh. <laughs> wait, okay. Okay, wait, we can't laugh too hard. Wait, get over there. <laughs> One. <laughs> Two. Now I gotta get mine. It's so hard getting those roots out of here. <laughs> Good job. You have to pull hard, <laughs> hard, hard. You know, everyone in my family is real animal people. And I did my, my PhD dissertation was on human horse communication. So my whole life I've just been like totally obsessed with animals. And then I started thinking, well, why am I eating animals? And I went through this whole sort of experience where I just came to this place where I didn't feel comfortable eating them because I felt like they like their lives as much as I like mine. And so that was sort of who I was when I met David. It was, it's just been a really interesting journey with him and coming here. And in fact, I lost some friends, you know, in, in marrying David because I had some friends that were vegan and it was really hard for them to understand that I could fall in love with a cattle rancher. It just could, it couldn't be possible for them. And I think in their mind, the way cattle ranchers get represented often in the media is like these gruff, mean men that don't care about their animals, and um, and that couldn't be farther from the truth. Ranchers are doing the work that the general public doesn't have to. And by that I mean, like, you can go to the grocery store and kind of disassociate, and you can you can buy your hamburger, and, and, and a lot of people, like, love animals deeply and still eat meat. And the way our industry is set up is you can kind of disassociate from the fact that this was a living animal that you're eating, you know, while you have your, your dogs that you love so much sitting at your feet. And the more I think about it is ranchers are doing that work. They're doing all the grappling and the, it seems like around the ethics of these things. And oftentimes I think um, ranchers get painted as the ones who are the ones not thinking about that. Mommy, I want to go home right now. We're going to actually. So what? I know it. Yeah. There might be mosquito bait down there. I'd get up if it were me. I'll help you. There, no, okay.
I'm not sure we should eat animals. It's hard, hard to eat without causing harm. Whether it's vegetables or animals, and and I'm not saying that as a way to justify eating meat, but that, but that I began to I think understand the complexity more once I came to live here. And I used to make it really simple, like you just don't eat meat. And then and I think when I thought, well, if I'm not eating meat, I'm not causing any harm. But then I started to study the food industry more, and got more interested in that, and realized, well, there's a lot of harm being caused by our plant crops. Too. I became really invested in how to create less harm. Like how can we eat with less harm? These big corporate agricultural entities have become so big that they get to then sort of dictate the structure of the industry. The place where most ranchers can sell their calves every year is into the industrial feedlots. It's not like there's all these other there aren't a lot of grass-fed finishers. There's a lot of corn and grain finishers. So then as a rancher, sort of, I think David was faced with this question of, like, I don't want my animals to go, I don't want them to sell my calves into the feedlots anymore. But then now David has to find somebody who can finish the calves on grass. Because in order, if we kept all our calves and finished them on grass, we don't have enough land. And most people don't. And in, this is the first year that he's been able to find a buyer that said he'll finish them on grass. It's, it's not easy. We need a stronger sort of middleman, I guess, to raise the calves on grass once they're weaned from their moms in order to really grow that grass-fed market. But it's not efficient, you know, and people want to eat a lot of meat. I think I, I thought, if you decide you want to work with them this way, you just do it. Um, or if you want them all to be in the grass-fed market, you just do it. And it's so much more complicated on the ground. They've been living a certain way on this very land for 150 years. For place, and for land, and for water, and for plants, and for animals. And that's been the beautiful part of the transition here. Of, I was surprised at how much love and care there is that happens on a ranch between the people who work with the animals and the animals themselves.